Welcome to Stories with Briscoe and Bradshaw. I would be Bradshaw, and that would be the WWE Hall of Famer, the man who sold Georgia Championship Wrestling to Vincent <laughs> Kennedy McMahon, Oklahoma's favorite son, Mr. Gerald Briscoe. And if you got a Mount Rushmore of referees, one of the greatest of all time, and there's a Hall of Fame, he's going in in the first class, 31 years in the business. Welcome to the show. Yeah, John, thank you very much, Brad Shaw and Jerry. I appreciate having me. Two legends like yourself, man. It's it's an honor to be on your show today. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks. Thank you, Mike. And I don't think it needs to be a Hall of Fame for referees. I think it should be a Hall of Fame for Mike Kyoto because you you were a very important third man in that ring. And as John will testify, you can't have a match without that third guy in there. Somebody that the fans respect and the boys respect. And you gain that respect, not only from the fans, but each and every talent that ever walked in the ring with you. You had their, their respect because you helped these guys out of tight spots. You, you helped. It's so important that the guys uh, listen to the referees in there, and they don't listen unless they have a ton of respect for, for the referee. And, Mike, you, you had the respect. You, you became senior referee at WWE, and it just wasn't by attrition. It was by hard work and earning it. So we, we, we appreciate you giving up the time today and coming on our show. And let's have a good time today. Hey, yes, sir. And thank you, Jerry. That coming from you really, really makes me feel good. And, and then as, as well for many years, and you ran that gorilla position, you knew what you were doing, and you actually helped me be a better referee to work with the talent and everything, being in my years for so many years and so many things and being an agent like you were for many years. In my well, I appreciate that, but your, your cartwheel still sucked. <laughs> <laughs> I would have loved to have seen that. Uh, <laughs> and Mike, Mike, share share that story with John. I, I, you know, we've had a couple of referees yeah, all night. I mean, and besides, <laughs> besides Jerry being in my ear, John, he'd be in my ear and I'd get out to the ring and he'd be like, do a cartwheel. Hey, do a cartwheel. I'm like, Hell no. I'm like, you know, from Chief J. Strombo from way back in the day and Jack Lonson being agents there, they, they didn't want the referee to do any ha-ha shit. And that's the way I grew up in the business, you know? And Jerry would try to get me to do a cartwheel, cartwheel, and I'd be like, no, I can't, no disrespect. And he goes, oh, God damn, your Steelers suck anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and then every week, come on, Mike. And you know the good... The dog match. Nope, nope. Sorry, Jerry. <laughs> the good part about this is this is going on during a match. That's what yeah. fans don't realize. This <laughs> is what's going on in the referee's ear during the match. You got Gerald Briscoe telling you your Steelers suck because you won't do a cartwheel. Right. Meanwhile, right. you got 20,000 fans out there watching this first match of the night because it's the dark match. And right. that's what you got going on in your head. Somebody <laughs> seeing the referee do a cartwheel and going, what the fuck was that? You know, and of course I wouldn't go back and see Barry Briscoe told me to do that. You know, <laughs> so I'd have all the heat. But yeah, uh, but uh, he, you know, he, you know how it is. You know, John. You know, during the course of the day, these guys they're, they're like talent man. They're, they're working their butts off. They're one running from one rehearsal to another rehearsal. As soon as they get through with one match, they got to jump in the ring and do a rehearsal for the next match. So. Things get a little stressful among all of us, referees and everything. And some of these dark matches, you know, I know the attention. I know Vince's attention, number one, is back there rewriting the show for pissing off all those young writers you know, and rewriting their segment. And I know Kevin's giving instructions to Kerwin, Marty Miller, because everybody knows Marty Miller, the cameraman. He needs instruction more than anybody. <laughs> right. so, I can't so wait he, to send that to him. I'm going to cut so, that out and send it to Marty Miller. <laughs> no, yeah, right. Well, he, he's, a, he's a big shot now, so he'll probably get me fired. Oh, wait, I've already been fired, so he can't do that. So anyway, <laughs> but I'm trying, yeah. trying to miss. So I know I know the boss's attention are elsewhere, and everybody's all stressed out, TV getting ready to start. We're having a dark match, so let's have a little fun. So, so especially the young referees, as you know, I'd get them out there. Okay, do a cartwheel, do a somersault. When you go down, hit, hit the first count. So... We're having fun. We're all doing it. You know, we're like laughing, all hard. It's breaking, breaking up the stress. <laughs> then one day, I happened to uh, look up while I'm telling one of the referees, I forgot who it was, and Vince is landing right over my desk with both both of his hands on my monitor and his face about this far from my, right. what the fuck are you telling them, Briscoe? Right. <laughs> I'm just telling them, cartwheel's coming up in a match. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, 
course, of course, a referee does it as soon as he gets back. What the hell do you? Well, Briscoe told me to. And I know it wasn't you because you wouldn't rat on me. Like, yeah, you know? No, and I wouldn't have done it. And I wouldn't have ratted. I don't <laughs> I, you, you would have done it if I begged you hard enough. Right. If I talked about your sealers and your quarterback at the time. <laughs> enough, but you, you and that damn uh, that, that quack trainer that we had there, Larry oh, Heck, oh, yeah. I was a Steeler fan. He, he, he had something special going on there, but I won't yeah. get into it because we'll have, have Heck on the show one day. I hope, I hope he, he may, he'll come on our show. And, uh, yeah. but, uh, yeah, Mike, it was a pleasure working. We, we had a, a great time back there and, uh, and, you know, even though all the pressure you're working 20 hours a day and, uh, and you got to go out there and assist all of them, but having that third man and the referee that guys count on, you were that guy that most of the guys requested, and that, that's a compliment to you, bro. Thank you very much, Terry. I really appreciate that, brother, coming from you and John, and I, I really do appreciate that. That, that it all, It's home with me, and to feel that I was appreciated from, from talent like you and Hall of Famers like you guys as well, and old school and, and in fans, it, it just touches home after a 35-year career. I, was, you know, I worked for the company for 35 years, but I was refereeing for about 33 years and then I made my debut on 31 years on 8 1989 on TV oh. because you just had to pay some dues for a while for a couple of years you just didn't oh. go right up to TV so I remember I, I remember a young Mike Tully Hill he used to come to Briscoe Brothers Body Shop pick up that old blue truck that we had parked yes, in the, and then a lot across the street from the shop, yeah. shop for years and, and load it right you guys used to be regulars at Briscoe Brothers Body Shop. It was worth the drive. <laughs> yes, yes, sir. And then there was a gentleman, uh, Ricky, Ricky uh, something. Ricky that, Hunter, Ricky Hunter. Yes, Rick Hunter. We used to stop Rick by Hunter. Ricky's Hunter, and we used to give him mats, and we used to do certain things yeah. and ring parts and all that stuff. Ricky Hunter, God bless his heart. He was a great guy. Ricky know. sells kicking, man. He's still out there. He's uh, awful, having a few health issues. Of course, he's at almost 90 years old now, but he was he was one of my heroes coming up at, uh, when I first came to Florida because he was such a great performer. Uh, people in WWE really never saw Ricky Hunter as, as Ricky Hunter. They just right. knew him as, as this old referee guy that set up the ring. But in his days, man, he would main event all over the state of Florida and do sellout houses. You guys had a heck of a crew there. How they? How did you become part of that crew? Uh, now, yeah, that that all started, Jerry, when I was about 15, 16 years old. I used to work in the summer times for Gorilla Monsoon. When Gorilla owned a little territory in a ring from Vince, and he worked for Vince Senior. So he used to do like Wildwood, New Jersey, Salisbury, Maryland, Philadelphia Spectrum. And Victor Quiones used to run the crew for Gorilla Monsoon. And Joey used to, of course, referee. Um, Joey being Gorilla's son that passed correct. away in a car up, accident. And I grew up with Joey. So I started working in the summer times on, you know, the whole summer. And I was making like 50 bucks to do the ring, 50 bucks to take the ropes, 50 bucks to play music, 50 bucks to time keep. And then they, you know, then they wanted me to sell programs. And I was like, oh, I got to sell programs because Joey didn't want to sell programs. They were just a little thin program with the, a seven, seven lineup card, maybe five pages of the program with Andre the Giant on, Tony Gurria, Rick Martel, um, you know, a bunch of the old school guys, uh, Big John. They, they had print back when Tony Gurria was in the ring. <laughs> <laughs> hey, if Tony Gurria hears that, he's going to want his money from it. That <laughs> 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 towels from the arena every night. <laughs> I miss Tony. But um, so, and then like, you know, starting to sell programs before the shows, during the sh uh, intermission and on the blowout, then before I tore the ring down. And, then, and I said, well, how much am I getting paid for, for the uh, programs? He's like 10 cents on the dollar. I said, oh, I said, okay. I'd sell 3,000 programs in one night. So I'd make $300 <laughs> there, $200 on the crew stuff. I was making 500 bucks by the time I was, I was 16 years old, making 500 bucks a night. I was making more than the boys. I was making more than the boys, probably. I guarantee it. I guarantee yeah, the guys yeah. that were lower on the card weren't making five hundred dollars. I guarantee you know, it. I was. I, I'm telling you, I had four cars by the time I was seventeen. <laughs> and I was a machinist and I was a welder, and I did that for a couple of years. And on the weekends, when even when I was going back to school, and in my senior year, I was doing it because he'd get out at twelve, and I'd go for the weekend to work somewhere for the weekend for Gorilla and Joey and them. And Tony Chimmel was, you know, actually doing crew stuff back then. So, um, you know, and then actually um, I went back to machinery and 
and stuff like that. And I was a machinist and a welder. And I worked for uh, Consarc uh, and Consarc Metals and built test missiles for the Navy. And I was a senior at the time and I became 18. My dad took a stroke, a massive stroke. So I wanted to get back and do something. I wanted to play baseball. I didn't think that was going to happen going to college. So I went back to grill and asked him, Joey, if I can get a job back with WWF at the time. And Gorilla said, yo, you've always worked hard for us. You're always a hard worker. You're always there. Sure. So I got back on the crew and Terry Garvin gave me a year, you know, a tryout for a year. And then they, they, they booked me and I became an employee, like by the time I was 19. So um, wow. I was making great money to help my family out. So that's what got me started. Mike, Did Gorilla I had... Mike, a lot of people don't realize the schedule there, but how many how many nights in a row? Well, I mean, we were working ungodly amounts of uh, time there. I mean, you, you're right out of school, so it didn't bother you at being 19, 20 years old. But man, the wear and tear it eventually caught up with you. But we we're, we're you're on the road. But just give an example. Sometimes at least twenty four. We were on the road at least sometimes 24, 25 days a month because we'd wow. be. We would, Tony Chimlin and I would take the ring truck plus maybe a steel cage truck. We would wind up on a 17 day tour around the States and we'd wind up somewhere in Montana or Nebraska or huh. California and go, holy shit, how far is it back to Jersey, Kyoto? Well, from California, it's <laughs> 3,120 some miles. Wow. <laughs> we to spend three days to get home oh. and drive it. And then we'd have two yeah. days. Maybe we'd have to go up to Connecticut too to do warehouse work. You know, with Mark Gayton and, and all these guys and Toomey and a bunch of people that worked at the warehouse. So we we really had, we were on the road at least with the crew stuff because we were driving the trucks at least an average of 23 to 25 days a month. Wow. Wow. Did did Gorilla's uh, territory, was that part of WWE at the time or was that a separate territory? That was WWF and he was working for Vince Sr. before Vince took over everybody. That was Vince had wound up taking over like the Bruno San Martino era in Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh. Um, he actually, Gorilla became just the announcer and then doing his stuff with Bobby the Brain Heenan in the studios and his shows there. And um, yeah, Vince um, actually like, you know, Vince said, I'm going to own everything. So of course he gave Gorilla a position everywhere, his commentating and his own shows with Bobby the Brain and other things. And then, um, yeah, that's where he just owned his own territory. That was from Vince Sr. He used to get all the programs shipped in from the company in Connecticut. He used to, you know, we already had the ring and stuff like that. And it was only bicycle racks, pads around the ring and, um, and, the, and the wrestling ring. That's it. Now, Mike, what was it like? I mean, uh, here, here's Gorilla Monsoon. You're, you're a high school kid. It must have been something to be around Gorilla Monsoon because he was such an imposing figure and he's dearly loved by everybody. I mean, yes, he, you know, what a great man he was. But it had to be just a, a thrill for, for a high school kid that was an athlete to be around somebody like Gino. Uh, it absolutely was. And, you know, Gorilla Monsoon, um, uh, he always taught me, he gave me a lot of words of wisdom. So I remember I was in a ring with the Brooklyn Brawler and Barry Horowitz. And wow. <laughs> you had to work hard. <laughs> you know, and Gorilla said, hey, I thought she pulls me aside. He goes, I, I thought you wanted to be a referee. He goes, I told you the referee in, in this business, like I tell Joey, is the longevity in this business. He goes, guys can go out there and have a good five-year, 10-year run. <laughs> There's not many guys that are going to have a 20, 25-year run as a wrestler, the longevity in this business, like Dick Kroll, Joey, and this guy, and he kept mentioning, is going to be refereeing. He goes, I don't want to see you in there acting like you wanted the boys, because you're not one of the boys. He goes, if you want to learn how to bump as a referee, that's fine. I said, yes, sir. Yes, sir. And then he always told me, never stooge on anybody. Because if you have to stooge on anybody to further your position, you're not doing your damn job right. And he goes, then you need to get another job. And I've always, that's, that, my, that was my one thing I always remember from Gorilla. Don't ever stooge on anybody for what reason, just to go in there, do your job right. You don't have to worry about burying anybody or stooging on anybody to enhance your job. And he's gave me so many other wisdom, like words of wisdoms. And, and he's just been a great guy. And there's times like when Joey passed in a car wreck, coming home from a 17 day tour from Salisbury, Maryland. Um, and actually the car wreck, me and Tony Chimmel had passed it. We didn't even know it was Joey in the car and Bruno. 
And um, we get the call at six o'clock in the morning from Grill. I get the call from my house and he told me it was just devastating to me, crushed me totally, that we just passed by our friend in the car accident at like four in the morning. We didn't even know it was him. Wow. And, um, you know, it just crushed him and everything. And then, you know, for a while I used to come home off the road me and Gorilla, I used to take Gorilla because his ill, his he had a couple of things with him, diabetic, and he, he was fighting diabetes, diabetes. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, um, you know, I used to take him to the bakery and do his chores. We used to go on the weekends, and he used to buy my mom a bunch of stuff at the bakery. And he used to run to all the places with him, you know, and he always carried about ten thousand dollars in his pocket, cash, always, <laughs> always. It wouldn't be less than 10 grand, you know, and I drive him around to do all the chores and then go back to his house, drop him off to get my car, spend a little time with him, you know, and uh, help him out and always say hi to Mrs. Morella. Um, and that family was a big impact to me in this business. And I'm, I'm glad um, the right person like Gorilla Monsoon taught me well. And Joe. Yeah, you know, uh, Mike, I heard a story about Gorilla uh, came from um, somebody who would know that Gorilla had an opportunity to get a medical medical procedure that would extend his life. And he chose not to get it. Uh, and that was because he was heartbroken over Joey. Yeah, he was. He, it just, after Joey passed, it, I mean, his mom was a wreck. Mrs. Morella, he was a wreck. Um, and I showered with Joey. We, we took a shower after 17 day run. I said, Joey, it was July 4th coming up that weekend. He had just moved to Tampa, Florida. He had just moved to Tampa, where I'm residing now. Um, and I said, Joey, I said, why don't you come stay at your mom's or, and let's go to the Long, Long Beach Island, Jersey Shore. We got the jet skis. I'm going down tomorrow. We got a house down there. You know, we, I was renting a house for the summer. And I said, he goes, man, I got to get back home. It's been 17 days. I got to pay bills. I got to do this. He, and he had to drive to Newark to fly back home. So the company was trying to save money. And they flew him out of Newark, where Salisbury, Maryland was like four or five hour drive from Salisbury to Newark. He passed BWI, Air, Washington Airport, BWI Airport. He passed Philadelphia International. Well, he never even got to make, you know, pass International Philly Airport. And he had to go all the way to Newark and he fell asleep at the wheel right by his mom and dad's exit, right by where oh, his mom and dad's wow, exit. Wow. And because you have to go past their exit to get to to Newark Airport on the Jersey Turnpike, so 295 uh, Interstate. It's just, it was just a, it was a mess. And after that, he was never the same, you know. And Mrs. Morella, she, I hear she's doing okay, checking on her once in a while. And um, you know, they were just both heartbroken. And then, um, you know, it's it's funny, like Valerie, his sister, which I grew up as well in high school, very good friend. She had two kids, twins. She named them Gino and Joey. Wow. So, at least that keeps the you know, and they're big name. Boys. They're big boys. <laughs> I, I, I read that uh, Tony Chimmel named his kid after Joy. <laughs> yes, he Is did. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yep. He has a little. <laughs> yep. Sure did. And yeah, uh, it, you know, it's just Gorilla, it's, Gorilla just never recovered. You know, you talk to anybody. I, I knew Gorilla a little bit, you know, when I came in WWE, but uh, you talk to guys that knew him through that whole time, all the way through his death. He just never recovered from that, from, from losing his son. No, he did not. He, he just, uh, he did like totally deteriorated. And um, like even Miss Morella, she was in shock for, I mean, for a good couple of years. And it was just so young and so devastating. And it just, it took me a good long time to get over it. You know, there was no more going on the road with Joey. There was no more seeing him at home and going out with him. And we hung out literally every day when we were off the road, we'd come home, do our own thing pay our bills, do our laundry and say, okay, bro, what do you want to do tonight? Oh, let's go here. You know, like, and, um, yeah. and for 20 some years for Joey already. And, and Bruno was with, uh, Joey in the, during that wreck, right? Downtown Bruno, Bruno Lar, right? Yeah, Bruno, yeah. Yeah. Bruno was in that wreck too, as well. And, uh, thank God he survived, you know, and, uh, it was just a sad thing. He, Joey just fell asleep at the wheel. It just, uh, you know, you're driving in the mid hours of the night, you work the TVs because we were taping TVs and they were still long days from 11 sure. to 12 noon to- we, we still would get out of those buildings sometime even when we're taping around midnight, uh, you know, that night that we could, we did four hours of taping if, it, if, uh, if I'm correct on that, but we, we did like four shows. And so we, you, you had to be there, you guys, especially you guys were there all day setting up. And then not only beside the setup, 
you had to get ready for your referee duties, and that would take all that. Then after that, not only had to do the referee, you had to tear all that crap down and load it back in that truck, get in the truck, and drive two or three hundred miles. You guys, you guys had probably the most brutal schedule of anybody, any part of our crew that we had that that it takes. And what a what a what a wonderful crew! And you know your emotion and your description of that just shows you what that backstage is like. We're, we're all family. I don't care what position you're in. And so we lose somebody like that on the road. And it affects everybody. It just doesn't affect the parents or, or the, the, the relatives. It affects everybody on the road because we look and we see that empty space. And it had to be, you know, you growing up with it, it had to be so extra hard on you just just seeing that empty space there, knowing Joey should be there. But uh, I mean, I was, what, what a great young man. We got great, great memories about the kid. And he had to help you a lot in your philosophy of refereeing, too. Yes, he did, sir. And and that's the thing, Jerry. Like, I always looked up at Joey because Joey did the, you know, the whole Kogan and Andre. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, and then in 92, I remember I was so, like, I was happy for him because I was like, damn, I want to be just like Joey, you know, because he was in the ring in 92. I, that was my biggest crowd I ever worked for at SummerSlam in London when we did uh, SummerSlam. Right. And, and Bret Hart was facing uh, the British Bulldog. And it went like 45 minutes and they tore the roof down, 82,000 people. And I was just like, I was just marking out for that match and marking out for Joey. What a great job he did. He's done Wonder so much. Match. What is your first very big match like that, that that you that you finally got to build yourself up to? Well, you know, there was um, the first biggest show that I did at that point in my career when I started on TV in 89 was that SummerSlam show was with 82,000 people. I thought it was phenomenal mm -hmm. for me because it was just an intense crowd. Never a big show like that in London. It was the first time we right. did a big show in London, Wembley Stadium. And uh, that was my first big show that night doing that i mean there's so many iconic guys and, and so iconic wrestlers and the boys i worked with with perfect back then and then kerry von eric and you know i was on top of it i was like wow like i'm getting to work with some of the best you know wrestlers in professional wrestling and uh you know of course and later on in my career there's so many matches like the rock and hogan that was just like one icon against another icon and it was just the the way the toronto sky dome and the fans greeted Hogan, it was just a turn on the rock. It was oh, like, man, yeah. <laughs> turning on the baby face, I love yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. I was, you oh. know what was amazing? You know what was amazing about that was Rock was still pretty young in the business. I mean, he was already the guy. He was already everything. But, you know, yeah. he had enough sense to not turn heel uh, right. when they turned on him because he knew it was a global audience. You yes. know, he had grown up second, you know, second generation, maybe third, if you know, however you want to count it. But right. he had enough sense to, to not go with the local crowd because he knew it was a global audience. It was really right. perceptive of The Rock. Yeah, but it was, it was. And then, you know, like, at that time, to me, here, at that time, Hogan was passing the torch to Rock, pretty much, in 2002, right? Mm -hmm. Rock hadn't been in the business that many years. And then Rock takes the torch and takes it to Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> it makes real <laughs> money with the torch. Yeah. You, to Hollywood. you just got the torch, you know? <laughs> One of the legends. And... But um, and that's what that guy, he owns everything now. I know. He owns. Uh, we, you know what we need to do, Jerry? We need to forget about billionaire Connie and go to the, go with the Rock. It's only what we <laughs> the need billionaire, to do. billionaire Dewey. That, yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> but well, Mike, hey, Mike, I mean, go ahead, Don. I was going to ask you a, a very serious question, yeah. uh, Tony Chimmel. Uh, yes, I always uh, thought hiring Chimmel was like losing five good men. <laughs> he, was, he was he was he was awful. Not a few good men, but five good men, huh, John? <laughs> That's right. Was he how was he on the ring crew? <laughs> he was great, man. You know, I love Tony. And if, if it wasn't for Tony Chimble teaching, you know, he's he's a good um four years older than me. So at the time when I'm starting him with him in the ring crew at 18, 19. You know, he's 22, 23. He taught me a lot, John, on the ropes, you know. And um, he taught me a lot. And we went through a lot. We lived, you know, we basically, we didn't get our own rooms because we were like, we we got, a, we, we got a room together because we drove in the trucks together. We roomed together. We played cards to late night in the room, you know, after we get in. We drank at the hotel together. We did everything together, you know. 
we were like brothers. And, um, you know, I depended on him. He depended on me. You know, when we used to have to drive thousands and thousands, I mean, we put God knows how many, a couple million miles on these trucks mm -hmm. wow. and um, on all the driving that we've done and in the flying in between and, and uh, renting trucks in certain places, international like Canada or other places. But um, he taught me so much, man, John. He really did, you know. I know, I know he, he's a little difficult. <laughs> Hard a little, a, a, a little, little, a little. Hey, I'm still trying to get him on my the, I don't want to bury him too bad yet. The, <laughs> the, 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 ours. He agreed to it and then canceled. Uh, yeah. I know. Well, yeah. So we yeah. we got canceled by Tony Chimmel. That's like the worst <laughs> cancellation you could have. Yeah. I could see John, if the John, Rock if the Rock John, cancels. John. Cool. <laughs> don't ever, don't don't advertise that. Don't talk about it. It makes us look bad. I mean, Tony Chimmel culture or something. <laughs> <laughs> but Chim Chimmel was afraid we'd throw him under a bus. I mean, hey, you know, there's so many opportunities to throw that guy under a bus, but the bus would <laughs> the bus would tip over when it when it ran over that big road tub body. You know? <laughs> so we don't want to enter, injure the passenger, so we're not going to throw anybody under. A bus, yeah, right. So. I know, but you know, Tony Chimmel and I would drive in like. He trusted me driving late at night while he's sleeping in the sleeper. Of course, you know, and I'm sleeping in the sleeper. And before we started with those cute trucks, we didn't have a sleeper. Remember, Jerry? Those, uh -huh. little, those little blue trucks. I mean, I don't, I don't, they sold that one that was at our body shop. And uh, right. they had a, ta a Steve Taylor, who was uh, the manager uh, yes. uh, at that time, yeah. called and said, Do you want, you want, you want the truck? I said, No. He said, Well, uh, he said, I'm going to sell it. I said, well, I tell you what, you give me the title and I won't charge you storage. And he, how much is storage? That truck sat there, what, five years? At yeah. Least? <laughs> yeah, I and know. That, but that old blue truck, that thing was uh, huffing and puffing. The, every time you guys would drive that thing in, I mean, it was ready for it sitting in the sun for a little while. But whoever got that truck, man, he, he got millions of miles on that truck and he got he got so many memories if that truck could talk man he'd be entertained for life <laughs> yeah right but um the uh, you know like and we we trusted each other tony and i driving thousands of miles when one's sleeping and the other one wasn't it was a big deal and there was some times you know i remember one time we were coming up to our exit it was about four and maybe five and six in the morning the sun even wasn't just about coming up we were driving nine hours from, I think it was from Rochester back to New Jersey, eight hours, and we wanted to get home after the tour, so we drive straight through. I remember I was driving that truck. He wakes up, and he's like, Kyoto. And I'm like, no, what? I, I, I don't remember falling asleep. I closed my eyes for a little bit, past our exit where we drop off our truck, and I was at least a mile or two before our exit on this interstate. And he was like, you all right? And I'm like, oh, shit. I didn't even know I passed the exit. <laughs> if he didn't wake me up, it could have been something could have been woof. <laughs> but uh, yeah. When, when, I, when I used to do that, they, they, they accused me of being drunk, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> accused you? <laughs> yeah, what a baseless accusation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, almost every rib backstage, and I love Chimble too. I put out yeah. years ago, I was feeding the elephant, and I put out uh, taking care of my friend Tony Chimel and catering. And right. everybody got mad at me for that. Oh, <laughs> but but Chimble, every rib backstage almost involved Chimble. Yes. Almost it did. every rib involved. Yes, it, he, he is the, he's business. the best sport. He's the funniest, right. and, and right. he it just it was so great to try to get Chimmel. Yeah, and he would he would I love it because he'd sell a rib. He would sell a rib hard. Yeah, not yeah. always sell them ribs, man. He can't sell them; they just keep coming at you. He's like, they keep fucking with me, Kiora. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, like I used to love when you used to come in, John, to TVL, and man, you'd give it to Byron Saxton. All that That's time. right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I loved it. He is good. Dude, but Byron, that. Byron would always say, "You know, we're the new APA." I said, "I'm gonna tell Ron you said that." And he goes, "No, no, no." He goes, "Me and Ron are good friends." I said, "Does Ron even know your name?" He goes, "Yes, he knows my name." He always says, "Hello, young man." <laughs> yeah, oh, I used to love when you come in there and get on him and get on. Oh, board. I always so much. TVL, brother. Always. 
Mike, Mike, we're going to jump around here. So it, the, the order of it, it's just, but one, one of the things that sticks out, we're, 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 we're roasting uh, uh, Chimmel right now, but uh, the, the great race in Penn, Pennsylvania, Penn State College, I believe it was, where he raced to coach uh, Jonathan Coachman yes. for the mile. Was you with uh, Chimmel on any of the training part of that? Because I'd be really interested on how he trained. But he, no, that, I, last, he trained. that last, that last lap, if you'll remember, he nearly lapped coach. Coach was getting ready to lap him, and he made up that, that three quarters of the lap that coach made up on him. And he was coming around. If the race would have been another 100 yards, they probably both would have dropped dead. But Chimmel, <laughs> <laughs> Chimmel outran coach and won, won, that, won that race there. But how in the hell did he do that? <laughs> I have no idea, Jerry. I thought Chimmel was going to lose that race like you wouldn't believe. We all did. <laughs> he was working out at the time. He was working out for that race because he'd be he'd go down to the gym, and I'm like, damn, I can't believe you're at you know the gym already. Like we'd be like, he's like, oh, I'm going to the gym, and he'd be card doing cardio and cardio and cardio. He did not want to lose that. It was I think it was believe it was for like a hundred push-ups or yeah, yep. yeah, and he had yeah. anywhere at any time he wanted them. He had to drop and give a hundred push-ups. Yeah. That's correct. Yeah, if he wanted ten right here or one. Yeah. Or anything, yeah. We did that game too between yeah. me and him. That's the only time, you know. It's it's, it's hundreds of thousand dollars an hour to, to run one of those production companies at a TV shoot. Right here, Vince McMahon and Kevin Dunn actually closed down production for an hour, or two hours to go yeah. watch this contest of these two overweight uh, backstage guys run around a track for a mile they actually stopped production so everybody could go out there and enjoy the enjoy the yeah. event I and mean, jerry that that was our first day on some new network i mean that was like the first premiere right. day so it was a huge day we're in pennsylvania that vince and kevin stopped everything to go see this race between jonathan <laughs> coachman and tony chimble man i was just glad chimble pulled it out man because i'll uh. tell you if not, he would have been. Um, well, coach, coach didn't take it serious. Coach just thought uh, anybody can beat Chimmel. Well, Chimmel really? trained. Chimmel yeah. trained. He, he would leave the production office and he'd go train. He had it down where he could run a certain mile under a certain mount, and yeah. coach spotted him 60 seconds. And yeah. Chimmel almost beat him head up, but he beat him by 59 seconds. I know. It, I love it. it was it coach was almost didn't finish. Coach got tied yeah. up, his back hurt, his legs <laughs> hurt. <laughs> I know coach is being this like athletic guy in sports and ESPN and all that stuff back in the day he talked about. And I'm like, yeah, and I couldn't believe Jim won that race, but it was fantastic. I popped, <laughs> I popped. And coach had to, what he had to do and the coach's credit, he did it. It, it, when Chimmel asked him for a push up, he had to say, I'm Chimmel's bitch, and he had to do a push up. Yes. So they got coach, <laughs> they got coach at his wedding. Uh, they yep. got coach. We're at a charity event one time. There's all these famous people there. Chimmel called on a cell phone, coach in front of everybody did it. Coach did it at the Pentagon one time. I mean, to coach's credit, he did hit, he completely owned up to the, the bet and did it. It was, amazing it's amazing that's what me and Chimmel used to do it i remember we used to play cards and then we bet we'd start talking shit and smack and then we'd okay let's bet 100 push-ups then okay we played jim rummy which we always played jim rummy because we learned it from arnie scolan and you know when arnie was an agent that's all you did when you were done right. come on kid let's play some gin oh shit here we go huh. you know, learn from the best arnie scolan it was great and then one day we're out in South Africa, Chimmel owed me like 100 push-ups. And I remember we're on a crowded bus in South Africa. I mean, it was crowded. And it was bumper to bumper. And I said, Chimmel was talking shit. And I went, hey, drop down and give me five right now. And I'm talking over people. Like, he knows what I'm saying. He goes, no, 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 no. <laughs> Not here. I'm like, right now. <laughs> 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 he used to because I used to get him and then I'd see Vince come walking through a TV hotel or something like that you know with the entourage here comes Vince getting ready to get it Jim will give me five right now <laughs> 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 it's the best oh, who's your daddy Jim will? who's your daddy you know <laughs> <laughs> but it was great man yeah I love them stories man Hey, uh, one time we were in Vegas, and I want to always want to ask you about this because I know you're good friends with uh, Gorilla. Uh, me and Ron Simmons were staying somewhere outside of Vegas. You know, everybody split a room back then. You know, as you talked about, and Gorilla asked us where are you staying, 
We didn't want to tell them we're staying at some flea bag hotel on the outside. And Gorilla goes, I tell you what, come down to Caesars. I got, I got a room for you. And just as a favor to me and Ron, he gave us like this huge gambler suite uh, up on top of Caesars. I mean, it was, it was so cool. He knew we didn't have the money for it. And he, he did right. that for us, but because he was such a, a, a big gambler and a, apparently a very good gambler. Very good gambler. Yes. He loved blackjack and stuff. And uh, he actually, um, you know, he, same thing in Atlantic City when we went to WrestleMania four and five. I remember Joey running out of money. He was like, I got to go find my dad. And I remember I was like, you're going to your dad to get money? You know, he was like, yeah. He was like, I was like, Joey, it's two in the fucking morning. I'm like, you can't do that. So I remember we went up to the room and he goes, and he puts, he pushes the two grand through the door. And he was, and this is it, Joey. And he goes, and Mike, <laughs> you guys better get the fucking bed soon. You know, I mean, we'd be like, okay, sir. Like, he always had comps at, like, at these Atlantic City hotels, Vegas hotels. He was a huge gambler and a very good one at that. Joey he gave I, you guys two grand at two o'clock in the morning. Yeah, we fronted you. Fronted us two grand because you know, and he shoved it under the door, John. Yeah, well, <laughs> the door and, he, and he's kind of bickering with at us, you know. And I'm like, you know, Grill is a big guy, man. He, oh yeah, he took him serious, you know. When he got mad, he was mad. But um, you know, there was no like ATM machines back then. There was no like, you know, we already spent our our advances. We take all the you know our advance cash. Um. And we, we blew our cash. So he just fronted us two grand, like a grand a piece. So we were kind of blowing that too. <laughs> what, what, what level did uh, Gorilla uh, gamble at, at the Black Tech table? Do you remember? Yeah, he'd be at that high level, like the uh, $500,000 tables, the big tables. He'd be- Really? I think it was $100 minimum or something. Because we yeah. always get the five or 15, you know, the five, 10 tables and stuff. Uh, you know, we, we, okay, we'd get up to gamble 25, 50 a piece, but he was always at the bigger tables. And we never sat with Gorilla. Gorilla didn't want to sit with us. <laughs> <laughs> he so, played poker too, didn't he? Yes, he played poker too as well. And um, he always used to play poker with these like kind of blue, blue glasses, his prescription blue glasses, you know, and um, yeah, he played poker. And uh, Joey and I like to gamble football. We always like, you know, bet football with a bookie. So we always bet football with a bookie too and had fun with that for a while. So, hey, I saw. Uh, I, remember, I, I remember Go ahead, Gino down, down in, I remember Gino down in, down in San Juan where they had gambling was down there. We went, I went, Jack and my brother and I went to a casino with him. And I mean, when he walked in there, like you say, man, he, you know, those high rollers, when they, when they know high rollers coming in. Those casinos, we, you know, an ordinary person thinks they get pretty good, but when a high roller comes in there, man, we were Gino, and it was like we were the high roller. Anything we wanted at any time, we we never we never had to wait for a half glass to get half empty. It was it was always full up. But being with him and just seeing the respect that Big Gino had in Puerto Rico, with with that, you knew that this guy would come in there and, and had spent some money in those casinos because they just don't give that stuff away. Like that. Right. I mean, he that he yeah. always carried ten grand in his pocket, Jerry. It was I like, remember that. I remember that choke roll. He used to pull out. He called it a choke roll because he pulled out and choke an ordinary person. You know, <laughs> he'd pull it out and start reeling <laughs> off those hundred dollar bills. Here you go, kid. Enjoy That's yourself. Right. <laughs> hey, our sweet, our sweet in Vegas had everything but Mike Tyson's tiger. <laughs> we had, we had, me and Ron couldn't believe it. We had all these beds, all these freaking couches. We had all these TVs. We're like, you got to be kidding me. We wanted to move in there. That was the nicest place I'd ever been. <laughs> hey, you know, Skandar Akbar used to carry a lot of money, but Skandar would have like ones wrapped by, you know, a bunch of ones wrapped by like two 100s. All and right. so he always would act like Gino, but Ack was too cheap. Ack, if, if Ack oh. had lost $10,000, he had probably had millions because he made, he was good with his money, but he carried that big roll that had two hundreds around it. The rest were like ones and fives and shit. <laughs> John in Oklahoma, in Oklahoma, we call that our Texas roll. <laughs> yeah. Uh, $1, uh, $100 bill, then $200, $1 bills there. So, you know, you flash that $100 bill, but man, that guy's loaded. But uh, that was our Texas roll back in Oklahoma. <laughs> Why did you call it Texas roll? <laughs> Because it's deceiving as hell. That's why. I knew that was <laughs> <laughs> You're just mad that our Houston Astros 
who are above board and have never cheated at anything oh, my are goodness. beating the shit out of your Tampa Bay Rays. No, they're not. They're beating the crap out of the Boston Red Sox. The Rays <laughs> didn't make it to this round, Doc. <laughs> because we're honest. We're honest here in Tampa. We don't cheat. We play by the rules. And we spotted you guys about $60 million on the payroll, too. So don't take it. Take <laughs> it, cheater. Yeah, who do you who do you cheer fire. for in a who do you cheer for in a game like that, Mike? Do you cheer for the cheaters who are the Astros, the proven cheaters, who mind you, not not accusations, but proven. Are the coaches proven? Uh, uh, it was proven. I mean, I, I my FBI sources told me it was proven. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and yeah. then the co then the coach that was coaching them goes to the Red Sox and now he's in the World Series. You don't think there's some collusion going on there? How do you like that word, man? John told me that word, Mike. Right, you know, collusion. <laughs> that means they're working with each other, Mike. <laughs> I am going with you, 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 be living in Houston for two years. My wife's from Houston, Texas. Uh, we're I'm for, sorry. Yeah, I know. <laughs> we grew for Houston. And like I always told the Heels, like I told you earlier, I always say, win if you can, lose if you must. By all means, cheat, you know. Cheat, you know? <laughs> well, Mike, Ger Gerald moved. He used to live right near the that guy who looks like Michael Hayes' son on meth, the Tiger King. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he moved He moved down to Tampa right next to Carol Baskin. So you tell me that man ain't tied into some nasty shit. So I don't know what's going on. There's tigers. There's free birds. I don't know what's exactly. going on, but Gerald Briscoe is above calling anybody a cheater. Oh. <laughs> the Tigers ate the free bird, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> They'd be popular yeah. Tigers. <laughs> yeah, Mike, they, Mike, uh, Mike, Mike, you look back on that. Uh, we're, we're losing track here, which we, when we have somebody like you on that we could have fun with, we do <laughs> this a lot, you know, but we're, we're having fun. We're, we are enjoying it anyway. Yeah. I hope you are too. Well, but, yeah. you know, yeah. Mike Kyoto, I mean, holy cow, Mike Kyoto. He started out with Hulk Hogan. Yes. Started out with Randy Macho Man Savage. Started out with Jake the Snake Roberts, Ravishing Rick Rude. And you finish up with uh, The Rock, John Cena, Roman Reigns. I mean, you know, from, from the start to finish, Mike Kyoto had been in a ring with a WWE superstar, not just a superstar, but the ones who carried the company. And like I said before, most of the time you were requested to be in ring with, with those superstars. What a career you had. I mean, yeah, and, and I'm, you know, you, 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 you hate for somebody that said, well, who was your favorite on there? I'm not even going to ask you that question because all of them were your favorites. Yeah. At the time you were in the ring, you, you enjoyed them all. But, you know, the, the, just, just the, the thought that, uh, who you share to read with, Mike. It's got to be satisfying it to yourself and your mind and your career, man. Yes, it, you know, Jerry, and, and, and I always think back, you know, after 35 years, how many stars that are like with The Rock and John Cena, what they're doing now and all the talent that I've worked with and some of the best professional wrestling uh, wrestlers in this industry um, in three and a half decades, um, it was, it's been a phenomenal career for me, you know, and I have no regrets, none, none whatsoever. You know, did I, would I have liked to go on out and retire, you know, and, and maybe help down the PC, which I was trying to, I was doing as well to train referees down there. And, you know, would I have liked to retire as a referee, one of the longest training referees in the WWF, WWE history? Yeah. Um, unfortunately, it didn't work out like that, but I have no regrets in my career. I've had a fantastic Fantastic career, fantastic time. Got to see a lot of meet a lot of interesting people, to see 60 something different countries, a lot of countries over and over, all throughout the United States, all throughout Canada. And I, I don't think in any other business or any other sport I would have got a chance to do that. And um, you know, in all the icon matches that I've seen, and and I can't say what are the what is the best, maybe some of the best reactions I've seen in matches, but I work with some of the best talent in this professional industry, in this wrestling industry. And it's, it's, and it's, it's awesome. And I appreciate, you know, the fans and the feedback and, and stuff and from the boys, what they've said over, you know, my career and how good of a job I've done. And I took pride in that. I took a lot of pride in that, Jerry. Mike, you had such a, a career that spanned the three great eras, 
probably in modern wrestling of Hulkamania, you know, from 93,000 people slamming the giant to Stone Cold and the Rock and the Attitude Era when we were doing ratings that will never be done again. Uh, to Cena and Roman, 103,000 people in Texas Stadium. I mean, you, you've seen, all, you've seen yeah. it all. Yeah, how would you compare, say, I, I know you don't want to rank them or your favorites, but how would you compare, say, the, the Hogan – to the Stone Cold and the Rock, to Cena and Roman. Man, uh, Hogan was just, he just, you know, he didn't do a lot of things. He just captivated people. The way he captivated the kids and the people, and he was like an American icon to the kids and everything with cartoons back in the day with just Saturday night, Saturday morning wrestling on and um, to the Attitude Era, to the John Cena Era. I do have to say the attitude era with Stone Cold and The Rock was phenomenal. I mean, you, you had DX, you know, you, Bret Hart had, was just making his way out, which I felt bad with his career, you know, but then he went into like, you still had The Undertaker, Stone Cold, The Rock, everybody, you know, the DX uh, era. The, the attitude era was, the, I think, the craziest era of all time. And the ratings were phenomenal. And you know, and we had these rating wars between WCW and the WWE at the time years ago. They were just, you know, everybody was on edge every Monday night. They were, you know, everybody like Vince and all these guys were watching that monitor. You know, what was going on in WCW Monday Night Nitro? And they were watching us, you know, to see what we were doing. Yeah. So it was we great. And I believe those wars are coming back, John and Jerry. Uh I think they're coming back, and I think uh, AEW is trying to make a little bit of a run here, you know. You know what was so interesting about that time was we would change our live show, and, and I'm sure they did as well, according to what they were doing. Right. You know, Finkel would be sitting there giving reports, you know, live updates, but we'd always have a monitor back in Gorilla at, you know, on, on WCW. We would change our live show depending upon what they were doing. There's never been a time like that in television history no. that you had two shows – that were that big. I mean, there's right. the two biggest shows on cable fighting right. each other like that, trying to put each other out of business, which no matter what these guys say, we are we are both trying to put each other out of business. Exactly. And uh, I'll tell you a funny story. When I was in Philadelphia, living in South Jersey at the time, I went over to Philadelphia and this was uh, right before uh, Big Show's uh, career started, you know, and he was a bouncer at this nightclub in Philadelphia. And then, you know, so... I was like, I looked at him and I was like, holy shit. He said, hey, how you doing, man? I said, hey, how are you, brother? I said, I'm Mike Kyoto. He was like, I know who you are. He was like, yeah. He was like, you know, he was wanting to break into the business. And I'm looking at this guy going, holy shit, in great shape, long hair, hands like freaking Andre the Giant. I'm like, holy shit. So I get Paul Wright's number. I get his number. I go back to Pat. Pat. I said, Pat Patterson, you got to see this guy. He looks like another Andre. Oh, there's no other Andre out there. Uh, don't, Kyoto, don't fucking tell me. He would not, you know, I said, Pat, this guy looks like fucking Andre. He's as big as Andre. He's in, he's in great shape. He's a big guy. He's got hands like Andre, everything. He's got to be four or 500 pounds. And then Pat was like, oh, give me the, so I give him the number. So next thing you know, one day I was walking, weeks later, I'm walking through the TV and here is uh, Vince and Pat Patterson in their little room watching Monday Night Nitro. And I pass by and who's on? Big Show. <laughs> Nitro. And I go, hey, Pat. I'm like, what happened to that guy? That guy's number I gave you. He didn't work out or what? He didn't want to sign? Pat goes, who? I said, him right there, the guy in there. And Vince goes, who, Mike? I said, that guy right there, Paul, Paul something. And he goes, when did you meet him? I said, at a nightclub, like a while back, about a month or two ago. And Pat goes, Mike, that was the fucking guy you met? Said, yeah, Pat. He goes, oh, I thought you were talking about Ogante, because we already had him signed. Said, fucking kidding me, Pat. He goes, Mike, you met this guy a month or two? I said, yeah, at a nightclub. He was a bouncer. And he Fuck, Vince says, excuse me, Mikey, shut, slams the door. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Out, Mike, Mike, fuck, I didn't know. I thought you were talking about Ogante. We already had him signed. And I'm going, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Told you this guy like Andre. <laughs> that is great.
Big oh. Show comes in when he signs with us. He looks at me, he goes, oh, fuck you, you piece of shit. Excuse my language, guys. And I'm like, whoa, 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 you better get the yeah. stuff from Pat, bro. You better get it from Pat because I gave Pat your number. You know? <laughs> That's great. You get a bonus signing and all this stuff because you hear if you bring somebody in, you get this bonus signing and everything, you know. <laughs> Hey, we, we were in Europe one time, and one of the greatest things, Mike, as you know, is the ribs on the house shows. Right. You know, th those were so freaking good. So I'm standing in the ring with Kurt Angle, and Big Show's coming out. And Big Show blames me for this, but I can't control the music from the ring. So obviously, I had a, an, at least an accomplice, probably somebody else that was directing <laughs> it, which you guys can guess who that was. So he comes out, it's hey, Big Show, his music's playing, and goes, hey, now, you're an all-star. And Kurt Angle looks at me and goes, what is that? I go, that's Shrek's theme music. <laughs> <laughs> so, Kurt, Kurt looks at me and goes, oh, my God, he's going to kill us. <laughs> Big Show hears it, and he turns red, and he starts sprinting to the ring. And when he gets to the ring, I say, Kurt, listen, it's my fault. I did it. I'll take full responsibility. <laughs> so we we're standing there. As soon as Big Show gets up out of the ring, I said, I swear to God, Kurt Angle did it. I had nothing to do with it. And I jumped out of the ring. Oh, my God. Hey, guys, do you remember this? When, where was this? In South Africa when Ron Simmons overflooded the tub and he flooded it? <laughs> yes. And I remember I'm out my balcony and I'm smoking a cigarette before I'm getting ready to get on the bus. I'm all packed up. Here comes a shitload of water, like, when the floor's up. And I'm going... What the hell is this? You know, I'm like, it was like a flood. And he flooded and he goes, God damn, I don't know. The people did it. <laughs> That's right. The people's, the people's did it. The people's so we're, did it. Yeah. So we're sitting on the bus and Ron's sitting there with those dark shades he used to wear. And he's just yeah. sitting there not saying a word. He flooded the lobby, everything. So right. I think one of the boys left his, uh, not, not as a rib by mistake, uh, left something happened. Right. So Ger Gerald Briscoe gets on and goes, Ron. Yep. Your, your whole room was flooded. Ron goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wa water was everywhere. Yeah, yeah. And he goes, yeah. <laughs> Ron, it flooded the lobby. It flooded everything. Ron goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was water. It's bad everywhere. everywhere. And he goes, Ron, what happened? And, and Ron goes, uh, the peoples, the peoples, the people, the people. Uh, and Jerry goes, what peoples? I he goes, I remember the peoples. Jerry. And that's all he would say over and over and over. Oh. Finally, Jerry goes, how about I just find you and we'll call it even? Ron goes, uh, yeah, that's a good idea, Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever happened, Ron wasn't going to stooge the boys for doing it. Whatever no, no, it was. No. Uh, the I people. The I people. remember he got fined or something, right? Or something. <laughs> that's right. When I'm sitting on that bus and he goes, the peoples did it. The people. <laughs> and I got the peoples. Like, <laughs> I'm like, what peoples? I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. okay. We're all just looking at him like, what peoples? Yeah. <laughs> that was a great answer, though. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, we were in Cape Town, and he does this great uh, promo about Africa and all this stuff and yeah. everything. Anyway, we get the Joburg, and if you remember, you had to check weapons at the at the gate, and there was a yeah. huge stack of weapons when we come in. Ron gets up, and he's got all these little red dots all over him, you know, from laser pins. Laser. But you don't, yeah. you know, we don't know for sure because there were guns everywhere. So Ron gets up. We thought, is he going to cut the same promo? So he gets up there and he grabs the microphone. He'd been cutting a hell of a promo every night on South Africa. He goes, I just want you to know. And he looks down. He's got shit all over. He goes, the nation is great. Tell him, Crush. <laughs> <laughs> and Crush grabs the microphone. He goes, yes. <laughs> and hands it back to Chimel. <laughs> I am a chimel. You can't mess. Oh. That's right. <laughs> yeah. I remember, oh my God. Some of some of the, some of those trips, like to Africa and to Europe, and the bus rides. I mean, the, the work schedule we had was was just outrageous. But the, the bus rides after the show, and even the morning bus rides, you know, trying to round everybody up, like getting Bradshaw out of a shower that the shower wasn't <laughs> turned on yet. You know? <laughs> yeah. And but. Uh, the little things that happen on those buses, you know, the car games, you know, and, yeah. and the rib that people just don't understand, you know, you just got to pass the time by and we pass it by just by being on each other. And I, and we loved it. <laughs> yeah, we did. We loved it. And that's what made it exciting being away from home, away from your families. Cause you know, it wasn't easy for any of us, Jerry, right, John. Yeah, I mean, it was right. just, 
you had to still pay bills. You had to still take care of your wife and your family at home. You still had, you know, personal things going on. Um, being on the road for 17 days, just to get out to South Africa. After we do a tour in the States, then you got to fly to either JFK and go direct to South, you know, SAA to South Africa on South African Airlines. And that was a 16 hour flight from there. You know, I mean, yeah. And then just to start another tour for a week yeah. or so and then come back and do TVs again. It was, yeah. Like, yeah. Because back then we did they, we did TVs once a month, you know. When then we went to twice a right. month, but once a month we do three days of TV, do pay per views, and then do four Monday Night Rawls, and then four weekend shows. And yeah. I remember one time we went to Germany and we were twenty three days. I mean, we worked like twenty one shows or twenty right. shows, whatever it was. Yeah. Right, we did. You know, we did. But back then you could do that. So we're on the bus all the time, just with each other, just going from town to town, just That's traveling it. circus. It was cool. actually awesome, though. I mean, it, you're right. It sucked being away from home, you know, but we were young and getting to see places we had never dreamed we'd get to see and never. just having a having a blast. Yes, and then that's the thing, too. I used to go out, like, it didn't even the last so many years, guys, like, uh, we'd go on the road, and John Cena, a lot of people would hang at the hotel all night, and me and Jack Swagger, which is Jay Kager, and, you know, and a bunch of guys would be like, come on, let's go out and go see the town. Because you never knew when you were going to go back to that city or country. You know, we'd always like the nightlife and go check out the nightlife and have fun and, you know, check out what, you know, Denmark was like or what this was like or Germany, you know, and we just had a blast. And I mean, you know, the road trips were not easy eating those European Sammies with, with the <laughs> They were terrible. Oh, <laughs> they were terrible. Yeah. Mike, speak, speaking of Denmark, was you on a plane, was you on a trip when we lost the Road Warriors in uh, uh, Copenhagen or where was it? Uh, <laughs> One of those cities like that, they they went they went they were our plane was delayed six hours, so they, the two of them decide they're going to take a taxi cab downtown. So they get like a group of guys together, and they and I'm telling them, guys, don't go, don't go, you you, you don't know, don't go. But the, but of course the with the LOD going, everybody else is tagging along. Everybody came back except LOD. Well, it came time to board the airplane. We had no LOD. Got on the airplane, went went all the way back to the United States. Still no LOD, and you know <laughs> we didn't have cell phones back in the day. You know, right. back in that back in that time, so you just you didn't know what happened to them. So you know, next day at TV, Ben said, "Well, Briscoe, we're we're the Road Warriors or LOD." Last I saw them, they were in uh, in uh, Copenhagen. What were they doing? I said, well, I think they were down on the trip, but I wasn't with them all, so I don't know. <laughs> I damn, they're fine. They're fine. Well, yeah. okay, but where are they right now? <laughs> <laughs> About a week later, they show up, and, you know, they went down to one of those houses down there and uh, and uh, started partaking, and uh, they never showed up for the flight. <laughs> and, yeah, I know. Yeah, Mike was, you know, I hung out with Mike, actually, a lot instead of, like, Joe, and Joe was always a good guy to me, too. Yeah. Though. It was hard. Mike and Joe are great guys. I'm they were, man. They yeah. really were. And, you know, I hung out with Mike quite a bit. And uh, he was a wild one, man. I mean, I used, <laughs> to, he used to take me to these Hells of Angels, Hells Angels uh, motor uh, bike club in uh, St. Louis a lot. Every time we were in St. Louis, he'd be, we'd go to the strip club and he'd be like, Yoda. I'm like, yeah. He goes, we're going to the see the Hells Angels at their warehouse. We're going there now. Let's go in a taxi. I'm like, what? Hells Angels? I'm like, <laughs> into this warehouse, man. And I'd be like, holy shit. Like, girls walking around with no shirts on motor, you know, just sitting around everywhere, party with no shirts on and tight little <laughs> shorts and all this. And I'm going, holy shit, bro. I remember so many times I used to have to run back to the hotel at like 6 30 in the morning seven to get my bags and get catch my flight you know <laughs> had a great time with mike over the years man and joe was I, well. I remember one time we were on a bus in europe and we we got there and i think korea gets on the bus to come up he goes oh you guys are already here it was like 6 30 in the morning he said no tony we're still here we hadn't checked in <laughs> <laughs> the entire crew is still on the bus drinking <laughs> <I know. laughs> That's crazy. I know, man. Got the time <laughs> to have back then, and just it's just you couldn't you couldn't explain it to anybody. It was just you know, when like Jerry, you said we didn't have cell phones. We had pagers, and pagers were never oh. working international, oh. you know. And you couldn't. It was always hard to call home over international using your calling card fifteen times trying to call home, you know. But the communication was with the boys, man, and we just had a blast, and we were just everybody. And I, I loved it when you know we all got together at a hotel bar or somewhere and just. 
shit would hit the fan in, in a good way or in a bad way, but it would still be a lot of fun. That's for sure. And guys are just looking for entertaining things to do. That's how all the ribs started. You know, oh, yeah. the ribs were fun. You didn't care. You know, if you were a recipient of a rib, you didn't care. Oh, you know, yeah. you just, oh. it's just, you're glad to be part of something entertaining. It was just, because guys had to be creative because we didn't have the internet. We didn't have cell phones. We had yeah. each other. Nope. And so all we had was we had to entertain each other. And that's why you had a bunch of guys who had extra time on their hands who were very smart, creative guys. And, and that sometimes ends up badly. That's true. <laughs> and, you know, like the other thing, too, um, I remember getting my eyebrow shaved one time, like half my eyebrow. Wow. And, I, and the bus ride I had, was, I could have sworn it was Bulldog, but I didn't see it, so I don't know. <laughs> So I had my hat down, my shades on. I was hungover. I'm trying to stay awake on this six or seven hour Germany bus ride. And the next thing you know, like I get all the way to the locker room, take a leak when we get to the arena. I take off my sunglasses, my hat to wash my face. And I look and I got like one eyebrow <laughs> like, was gone. And I'm like, what the fuck? Oh, they got me. They got me. Shit. I'm like, they got me. Bret Hart comes walking in. And I knew he used to. He used to do a lot of cartoon stuff and color and all this other stuff. And I'm like, Brett, you got to help me out, bro. Can you color to something like color something in on the eyebrow? He's like, so he tries it. He's laughing. He's laughing. He's like, who did this? I'm like, I don't know. Whoever, man, you know? And you see Bulldog coming in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and this dude's big as all get out. And I'm like, Arr. I'm like, I didn't see him do it. So I couldn't accuse him. You know, so I'm like, and if I did accuse him, what the hell was I going to do anyway? But so I'm looking at Bulldog. He's looking at Brett. Trey, he's like, nah, that's not going to work, Kyoto. I was like, well, what the fuck do I do, Brett? What do I do? He goes, you're going to have to shave the other half. <laughs> like, yeah, that makes oh. sense. Yeah, let's just yeah that makes sense. <laughs> he's, he's as stupid as green as I was. He shaves the other half, and I got these two little stubs, like, right up here. <laughs> <laughs> You know, guys used to go to sleep on a plane with band-aids over their eyes. Remember right. eyebrows? Remember so guys wouldn't shave them? One yeah. time it was uh, Davey had shaved some eyebrows. So he's starting to think, uh-oh, I'm going to get caught because he shaved too many of them. So he <laughs> shaves his own eyebrow <laughs> to take the heat off himself. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Between him and Henning, it was brutal yeah. being on a yeah. plane. Yeah. Yeah, perfect was yeah. he. Kurt Henning was a he was a major river boy. Yeah. Him, Owen, Bulldog, yeah. and all yeah. the guys. Man. We had some king of rivers back in those days on those tours. That was my always my my biggest fear when I when I was managing a tour overseas. Like I was always deathly afraid to go to sleep because being in the office, you know, you got to meet with with building executives or you know promotional executives. I was, I was, I was my biggest fear of going to sleep and waking up with no eyebrow. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, that's why I was wearing a hat and sunglasses because you'd have to yeah. lift the hat. Yeah, and right. Sunglasses off. Yeah. He yeah. got it done somehow, and I was just like, "How did I not feel that?" <laughs> Dave, Davey was very creative when it comes to that. <laughs> <laughs> Davey was great. <laughs> he was so good. He was. I remember we were coming down an elevator in somewhere in Europe. And I remember Davey's in the back and I'm looking at Davey. It's winter time and businessmen get on and they had all these trench coats on, long coats, wool coats and stuff. And, and all of a sudden, next day I look over and Davey's spraying them with this Gillette foam, like this shaving cream and spraying it all over the back of their coats and they don't even feel it. <laughs> I'm popping huge. And he's like, you could have shut up, killed her. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, no, no, no problem. I'm laughing so hard. And three of these guys has come off the elevator with shaving cream all over the back. <laughs> like, Dave, you got balls, man. Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> guys have no idea today. They, they look at stuff and go, oh, that's just terrible. They should have been around about 25 years ago. It yeah. was, oh. it was, <laughs> brother, oh. it was a wild, wild west on it those was. bus trips. There were no prisoners, man. I mean, everybody was fair game, too. I mean, it wasn't, you know, just no. just certain guys. They, they, we picked on everybody. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because yeah. you think about it, you get you get your eyebrows shaved nowadays. If you go, oh, I'm going to call a lawyer. I'm going to sue. Back then, it was like, oh, the bastards got yeah, me. Yeah, the guy made it. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's, that's the funny part. It's like, you know, with, with all the outstanding ribs. And I remember Owen, when I did – 
refereeing and I'd come back and play music in the back. And I'd have headphones to the guy to play the sounds for after the, after the, uh, the match. And I'd cue the guy up and say, okay, hit this music and I'll cue you at the end of the match. And I remember I used to go to the bathroom and I knew this match was going 15, 20 minutes. I had time to go uh, two, three minutes down there to lock to go to the bathroom real quick. Next thing you know, I'd hear the freaking music playing throughout the, the arena. And I'm going, what the hell is that? Why is that guy playing the fucking music down? The match is not over. Like, you know, I'd come running back. Jack Lons would be coming down. What the hell's going on, Kyoto? What are you doing? How come you're playing the music? I'm like, I'm not, I'm not. So I get on, I'm like, hey, I didn't tell you to play the music. He was like, yeah, you just got on a couple minutes ago and told me to play the music. Hit the music. <laughs> Look, and Owen's laughing over there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Oh, oh. <laughs> it was Owen that got one time, we're in uh, San Jose, I think it was. And remember Howard Finkel would come out to Welcome to the Jungle? Yeah, and yeah. He, would do the, he would do those Hindu squats right before, and he'd get himself fired up like he's going to a fight. Then he'd bust out of that curtain, and out would come Howard, and the nice, you know, nice tucks, and people yeah. would go crazy because that's the first thing they would see that night was Howard busting into the curtain. So yeah. Owen had put a string about ankle high right across <laughs> outside the curtain. <laughs> we're sold out. We're the first time. So, you know, when Steve got hot, we're finally selling out arenas again. He's so excited. But, and oh, he's sitting there, welcome to the jungle. He busts open the curtain, he hits that string and falls flat on his face Jeez. with all the spotlights on it. Oh. <laughs> it was... Howard is <laughs> so mad too, though, and you ribbed him too, boy. Oh, oh Howard was the worst about selling it. You talk about Chimmel, but Howard was selling yeah. it by not, by not selling it. Guys, right. not a big deal. Not a big deal. Guys yeah. get ribbed all the time. Not a big deal. I'm not selling <laughs> it. No, no, no worries. No worries. Those things happen. <laughs> Boys are just the boys. I'm not selling it. I know. <laughs> Howard, you're selling it by not He's selling, selling it. it. I remember Howard used to go around to me and Jim, do you know who did that? Do you know who did that? <laughs> yeah. No, I don't know who did that, Howard. <laughs> <laughs> like you're going to tell him. <laughs> you know, like you the boys are going to tell him. Right. Uh, no student on this part, boy. I'll uh, tell you that. Uh, <laughs> you want to come I, back to you, boy. If, you, if the boys found out you were a stooge, ooh, you know, ooh. the trouble you'd be in. Oh, my. Oh. That was yeah. worse. That was as bad as being a thief. I mean, that was uh, right. You would be out of work if right. they found out you were a stooge or a thief. Right. Exactly. I know, you wouldn't, have, I know you wouldn't have a place to dress. Uh, somebody would make sure that, <laughs> that uh, right. you better that believe would, it. <laughs> and rightfully so. <laughs> That's right. I've seen hey, that Mike, quite I, a few the talents where they're sitting and dressing in the, in the hallway or somewhere else. Uh, <laughs> what happened? Oh, I got asked to leave the dressing room. <laughs> yeah. Ask. Uh, that's pretty pretty polite of him. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. There were a few that happened to. You know, you end up they they dress out in the hall or wherever else, and hang on. It was yeah, it was recently it happened to uh, the Miz. I remember Miz had a dress out in the hallway for quite a while. Um, that was uh, some Chris Benoit's doing, I think, and John Cena. Yeah, Miz. Uh, I know exactly what happened because I, I, I took credit for it for years of storyline wise. You, you know, took the I, heat for you took the I heat took the, for it. I took the heat for it, but I had nothing to do with it. It was Miz was eating. Well, I really didn't. Miz, Miz, and Miz has said that since I he was eating some chicken over Scott Armstrong's bag. You know, yeah. just not not thinking. And uh, Benoit threw threw him out of the dressing room. Oh, that's right. It was something so simple as that, right? Or that's something. right. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. Miz used to be like bah, 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 a lot when he first started, you know. And uh, of course, he's a star now on Dancing on the Stars, Dancing with the Stars. Um, and he's he's done a hell of a job with his career, Miz. But I remember that. And recently, it happened to um, Enzo. And I remember John Cena made Enzo dress out there for a while. <laughs> Roman Reigns. Roman Reigns did that. Roman Reigns. And it's good to know that some of the traditions are still intact there. True. True. And yeah, Roman Reigns is old school. So many generations of wrestling there. Too. Right. He, was, he made Enzo dress out in the back. It was some stupid stuff he was doing. So, you know, yeah, I mean, you know, when you disrespect the business or the boys in the locker room or anything else, you know, you're going to get heat. That's for sure. Hey, Mike, uh, so I saw an ads free show, which, by the way, uh, Billionaire Connie, you know, he's trying to run me and Briscoe out of business by taking over our podcast, you know, kind of like Billionaire Ted and Eric Bischoff did back in the day. Gotcha. Uh, so I, I wanted to watch some of your ads free stuff, which is excellent, by the way. 
but I had to pay $29 to get to it. So <laughs> I'm going to send Billionaire Connie an invoice or something because it <laughs> he's got enough money. He doesn't need me and Briscoe's money. He's just, I'm not sure what this is. And you're working for the evil Billionaire Connie, by the way, which That's we great. won't, <laughs> which we won't bring up. <laughs> but I saw a, a story you told about Visra and, and an ounce of weed in the border. Oh. Yes. That story was excellent. And, you know, that, and because I've helped Visra and Godfather out before on much the same deal with dogs going crazy. And, you know, so tell, tell the story. Yeah. So one day we're coming back from Canada and we're coming to the border. Now, all of a sudden, you know, you're coming up to the border. The car was reeking because this border thing <laughs> popped up quick on us, you know, and like you couldn't stop, turn your car around. You couldn't exit. You were stuck. And that same road just going because you know, the border's coming up. So you're really stuck. And we couldn't stop. And Viscera wasn't getting rid of the weed. And we, we were just had gotten done smoking a joint. The car reeked. Snitsky was bitching. He's sitting next to me in the back. Rosie's driving. And Viscera's up front in the passenger seat. So we pull up to the border. And I'm spraying it with cologne the car. I'm trying to spray it. I'm doing everything. Snitsky spraying his cologne. It smelled like, oh, my God, like a... You know, what do they say, a French whore or something like that? Or <laughs> you know, in the car, it just it stunk like oh, everybody's cologne. Next thing you know, he won't get rid of it. I was like, this, you got to get rid of this, Miz, man. Throw it out the window. Just throw, throw it out the window. He's like, no, we're cool, brother. We're cool. I said, no, we're not good, bro. These are bordering. They're dogs. There's dogs there. We pull up. Snitsky's like, Visk, I'll buy you another bag. Just get rid of the shit. He's like, no, nope, because I won't have it tonight by the time we get to the hotel. <laughs> I'm like, oh, my God. So next thing you know, we pull up to this border. There's two dogs, four guys, four Border Patrol agents. And they look in. I know they have to smell a car smelling like cologne. It just reeked of cologne. And they're looking in. And they're like, oh, oh, sh shoot. These are professional wrestlers, guys. And I'm like, and they like, start marking out for us, John, Jerry. I'm like. Oh my God. Okay. They're marking out and the dogs are like wagging their tail. They're, they're going nuts, but then they're telling the dogs to sit, 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 you know, like stay. So next thing you know, these dogs just, they just plop, you know, once they, they get told something, you know, I guess they didn't get told search the car, check the car, <laughs> anything. So we're standing around now we're all out for taking pictures with these guys and Kodak moments with the little Kodak cameras. And I'm sitting there actually taking the pictures for them all, you know, like, okay, cool. All right, guys, cool. It was like a little five minute meet and greet. <laughs> and, the, and the dogs are just howling. And they're just howling. They're just, <laughs> and, they're, and they're just sitting there though. And they're like, and the porter kept telling them, stay, stay, stay. Like the dogs are like trying to tell them something going, oh, these dogs know we got Smiths in the car. They know it. They know it. <laughs> so next thing you know, these dogs are just running around the car. They didn't even search the car, nothing. We took pictures. We signed, they signed autographs, the boys, you know, Snitsky's Mark, you know, like he's, he's freaking out. Cause he's like, we're going to get busted. We're going to lose our jobs. Next thing you know, they say, okay, guys have a great night. We're like, holy shit. I'm like, my heart was racing the whole time here, Jerry. Cause you know, if you get busted at the border, you're done. Yeah. Man. You're done. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> next thing you know, we drive on down the road. Rosie's like, let's get the hell out of here. Two miles down the road, we get pulled over by a state trooper. Right. Oh. Now, Rosie is now because as soon as we pulled off, Viscera lights up a joint again. You know, like, <laughs> you know, the pre rolled a couple fat joints for the ride. So he lights up another one. So here we go again. Cops coming on us. The lights he comes out of the side of the interstate, out of the woods. And I'm like, oh, we didn't even see him. So he gets us, he's getting us for speeding because we were speeding down the road. Next thing you know, I'm like, this, this throw, he hands it back to me. I take the joint, throw it out the window, right? Now all you see is sparks going on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't tell the officer I threw out a cigarette. So now Rosie won't pull over the car because it stinks. The cops up on us. I'm like, Rosie, you got to pull over. Jesus Christ, he's going to call for backup. He's going to see how big we are, how big you guys are. He's going to get scared. I'm like, fuck, bro, pull over. He all, he goes off the exit. He goes all the way to the gas station. I'm talking for at least another mile or two, and this cop's on our ass with the lights on. You know? <laughs> Cop pulls up to the gas station. 
Viscera gets out of the car straight away, goes right to the bathroom. <laughs> and now this cop comes up. He's like, I said, sorry, sir. Like our buddy had to go to the bathroom. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're, you look guilty <laughs> as hell. Right, guilty as hell. Shit flying out the car, guy gets out and runs when he gets to the gas station. (laughs) Snitsky's huge with big beard, Rosie's big dude. And he's like, then all of a sudden the cop looks at it, he goes, where's your buddy going? What the hell is he doing? He had to take a leak, sir. He had to go to the bathroom really bad. We were stuck at the border for a little bit, taking some pictures. He goes, you guys are professional wrestlers? This cop marks out all of a sudden. The state oh. trooper starts marking out. I'm like, oh my God, thank God. And like, I'm like, yeah, sure, sir. You want me to take some pictures with you? Do you have a Kodak camera? He was like, no, but I'm going to go into the uh, gas station and get one. You know? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. So he goes in, he gets a camera, and we're taking pictures all over again. Here comes Vis back out to the car. He's like, hey, do you mind if I get your picture with it? And this is like, sure, no problem. You know, and I'm like, oh, my God, thank God this is working out for us. I was like, you know, I, I figured the first time we get away with it, but the second time we were getting busted. Then next thing you know, he goes, he goes, OK, guys, thanks a lot. They sign autographs for him, take pictures, do this. Give him, I think somebody had some eight by tens. Next thing you know, this is like, all right, just wait till the cop pulls off. I'm like, where's the weed? This? He goes, it's in a trash can in the bathroom. Let <laughs> me go get it. He's like, would you coyote? I'm like, <laughs> I'll get it. So I'm like, fuck. So I'm in there. I'm digging through the trash can. There it is at the way in the bottom of this trash can. <laughs> Pull it out. Got it. Crotch it. I got it. <laughs> and we take back off. I'm like, can we stop smoking pot until we get to the hotel, please? I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> well, Unbelievable. You, it was just, Unbel- you know, and you have to be there because, you know, like people, I know the story yeah. doesn't sound like it really happened, but it, it just, it was stressful, man, with all within a couple of miles from the border to the state trooper to the gas station. I thought we were history, you know? Yeah. We had a checkpoint one time. It's me and Godfather, Visra, and Ron. And uh, we, we have a checkpoint, a bunch of police. And Godfather says, hey, no, has anybody got anything on them? And me and Ron, all we got is Coors Light. You know, <laughs> that's all we do. Like, we got nothing. And Visra goes, no, no, nothing. And right as we pull up, Vistra realizes that we're going to get stopped for sure. And Vistra goes, guys, I'm carrying. (laughs) (laughs) I thought Godfather was going to kill him. He goes, I ask you. I ask you. (laughs) I know, man. It was was a trip. There was another time at Detroit Airport. We were coming back from a show, pulling back into the hotel at the airport. And me and Vist get pulled over. I'm driving, of course. And Vist has got a big bag, and he's smoking in the car. This cop came out of nowhere. Then the next thing you know, the cop pulled us over. And he said, next thing you know, we're sitting there. And I'm like, oh, my God, I had no spray, no nothing. And I'm sitting there, we're doomed, bro. We are doomed. I'm like, this crotch that, please, crotch it. You know, and uh, next thing you know, the cop gets on a microphone. And he said, I need the driver of the car to step out of the car and come back to the police car. So I come back and I said, yes, sir, how are you? He goes, you boys better slow it down. You just got lucky. I got another call. And he takes off. I'm like, <laughs> wow. I'm like, did he see us smoking? Because he got lucky. I guess maybe on a speeding ticket or, you know, but I'm thinking maybe he's seen us smoking in the car too, you know. But, uh, one time, one time, Mike, we're flying into Vegas and you come down that long escalator down to baggage claim and a, and a police officer's there with his dog and he says, uh, hey, uh, Bradshaw. And I said, how you doing, man? And he goes, uh, can I get a picture? I said, yeah, of course. And I said, uh, your dog. I said, what kind of dog is it? He goes, uh, a bomb dog. I said, do bomb dogs smell drugs? He goes, no, it's one or the other. I said, so your dog can't smell drugs. And he goes, no. I said, you want to meet the boys? <laughs> <laughs> that is so I'm coming down the, ele- the escalator, down all the boys now, because I, t- I stopped to take pictures with the cop are sitting around waiting on their bags. Yeah. I'm coming down the escalator with this cop and a dog. <laughs> the guys look up and go, what are you doing? Guys I are killed you. Their, I killed you, man. <laughs> guys are leaving their bags. Guys are jumping over baggage. <laughs> <laughs> guys are getting out of there. Exactly it was so funny. 
John, John, you mentioned that tour earlier, that 21 day uh, tour in Japan, or 22 to 21 day where we were, where we worked 20 days out of it. We, we were at an airport one time and we were changing airplanes. We had to get one of those little, little trolleys to take us from an international plane over to a local plane. You know how we used to have to transfer. So they bring those, those, those trolley cars out to us. So we're all loaded in there. Paul Bear was there uh, was there at the time. And, you know, Paul had a lot of friends over there. A lot of crew guys were local guys. And Paul liked that, that hard hat. So we're all jammed into this, this streetcar getting ready to go to the, to the domestic terminal. All of a sudden, we turn around and there's two cops coming along. Those German cops, you know, big old muscle bound. And they got two German uh, shepherd police dogs with them. So, you know, we'd been already been there about a week or so. So, every, you know, the guys that are carrying were carrying, of course. So you see all these guys, when you see those two police dogs coming towards us, of course, everybody thinks they're drug dogs and they're coming towards us. So everybody, you know, trying to get rid of their staff. And Paul Bear, I see Paul over there. He takes out and I see him taking like a Hershey bar. And he stuffs it in a mouth, but it's a Hershey bar of hash. About 10 minutes later, you know, and those dogs get right up to the, uh, to our street car, to our transportation car, and they turn and like they got a call and they had to go someplace else. So everybody in there, and you look over Percy, he just swallowed that big <laughs> chuck. Of, and for the next hour and a half, he was in a place where nobody knew where he was. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I miss Paul Barry. He was a good oh, guy. What a great guy. What a great yeah. guy to travel with, too. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Paul Barry. God bless oh, his heart. Yeah. yeah. He was so funny in, in, in everything. Everybody just loved him, but he was quirky, too. You know, he would yeah. get mad about certain things, you know, but, but he was, hey, he's Paul Barry. So nobody cared. You know, everybody yeah. loved him. He was, he was just, he was just a good dude. He and yeah. Kane were like the odd couple when they'd ride together. You know, it was, he'd always get mad at Glenn for something that Glenn couldn't figure out what he's mad at, wouldn't speak to him. And <laughs> <laughs> it was great. We, you know, you know how we used to bump cars all the time going down the road. Oh yeah. Me and Wendell pull up behind Kane and Paul Bear, and Paul Bear makes Glenn pull over and won't go. He goes, I'll walk to the building. Glenn goes, it's seven miles. You're not going to, you're not going to walk to the building. He goes, that's dangerous. It's dangerous what those guys do. Oh my God. You think? <laughs> that's why we do it. Uh, I remember that. I remember the uh, the night we were. I was you know, doing crew and reffing, and uh, I remember Jake the Snake borrowing um, the Godwin's car, and he was asking to borrow cars and everything, you know. And he was like, uh, and I remember he came up to me and Jim was like, "Hey, can we borrow the ring truck for a minute?" Like, Bro, we can't borrow. We can't give out the ring truck. I'm like. No way. I'm like, yeah, you're going to have to ask Tony Chimmel, but for what? Like, we can't give that up right now. I said, you know, if something happens, we're going to have to compete with the office, you know? Um, so then he's, then I, then finally they get Jake. I remember Jake gets uh, the Godwin's car, you know? That's right. Yeah. The Godwin's had just come to WWE at the right, time. Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, everybody was getting their advances and stuff like that. So they got their advance and then they took, uh, Jake took his car, their car, and Jake never showed back up. He was gone. That's right. And I was <laughs> yeah. like, this has got to be a rib. And then they didn't, he didn't even show up for his match. And I'm like, oh shit, this is not a rib, you know? And I remember we had to give the Godwins a ride to the next town because we didn't know where Jake was or the car. So yeah, remember, Jake, Jake and the car was missing for weeks, right? For weeks, weeks yeah. Yeah, weeks. They, they couldn't find his rental car. And then uh, and I remember, I remember Tony Jim and I go, Thank God we didn't give Jake, you know, the, truck. <laughs> the ring truck. <laughs> I borrowed that ring truck, brother. And I'm like, All right, man, but you know, and then, uh, and then that's when the Godwins came up to us and they said, "Yeah, we just lent Jake his car." I was like, "Yeah, he asked us to borrow the ring truck." And he, he has to borrow the ring truck. I'm like, "Yeah, well, thanks for giving me your car, but we were like, <laughs> we here we are driving the Godwins in a truck." <laughs> <laughs> And they're pissed off as fucking me, and I'm going, Chimmel, thank God that could have been our ring truck out there. <laughs> hey, how about the time Vince asked you to borrow the ring truck keys? Oh, yes, he did. Um, yeah, we were at, so I think we were in Richfield, Ohio. Remember, we used, we used to do Survivor Series on Thanksgiving. Yeah, on Thanksgiving Day, yeah. Yeah, and we used to do Richfield, Ohio, it was. 
And um, we used to go out there on a Tuesday and set up. And I think it was like a Wednesday night when you know, set up was done for you know going into Thursday. And then it was a Wednesday night and everybody was drinking at the Holiday Inn bar. And Vince was getting hammered and everybody was getting hammered. And he was, you know, he was with Kevin or whoever he was hanging with Vince. And Vince goes, hey, Mike. Is the ring truck? Where's the ring truck? I'm like, oh, it's right outside the parking lot, sir. And it was snowing. And it was like a ton of snow from before. And it was snowing at night. It was freezing because it's November at that time. In of November in Ohio. Next thing you know, Vince is like, give me the goddamn keys to the truck, Mike. I was like, uh, um, yeah, sure, boss. No problem. And then I'm like, I gave him the keys. And he goes, all right, come on, come with me. And I'm, I look at Chimmel. He was over at <laughs> at the table. I'm like, Jimmel, Jimmel, come here. He's like, what? I'm like, Vince got the keys to the truck. He goes, why the fuck did you give him the keys to the truck? <laughs> He's a mom. Truck, <laughs> Owns, Owns us. <laughs> How am I not supposed to give Vince the truck? Huh? The keys. He's like, where's he going? I said, I have no idea. So they were like, he said, come on. He said, come on to who? I said, he said, come on to me after he took my keys. So me and Jim will come out there. Now we're in the truck with Vince. We're in the truck with Vince. <laughs> trying to do donuts with this 20-foot truck, you know, with a sleeper cab. And he's shifting gears. He's like, God damn it, can't this go any faster? I'm like, yeah, <laughs> I'm a fifth gear going down the highway. <laughs> First and second gear, sir. He's like, God damn, this thing is slow. And I'm like, well, we get to the towns, we don't ever miss a show, sir. Get <laughs> up. <laughs> I swear we always, he almost tipped the truck two or three times. And she was like, <laughs> the keys. I'm like, oh really? I'm like, okay, you say no. We'll get him out of the seat. You know? the seat. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, so it was uh, that was a mess. I thought he was gonna, I thought he was gonna capsize the truck, man. I really could have <laughs> Vince McMahon is the worst driver in the world besides <laughs> Bruce Pritchard, I think. So Vince is, is an awful driver. driver. You always like somebody to drive fast, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I never, will, I never will forget the time. I, the first time I was ever in a car with him, I was just starting in the in the office work. As as you remember, Mike, I did promotional work. Then I got promoted and I got got in the office at the yes. time after after my promotional work. So uh, my first thing would go to Albany, New York, on, on Monday night, and the next night was Lyle, Lyle, Lyle uh, Mississippi, or not Mississippi, but. Uh, Massachusetts, oh, whatever yeah, it'll say to Lowell, 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 whatever it is, yep. to uh, uh, Albany. So Bruce and Pat was with, I'd flown in from Tampa, and Bruce and Pat Vince had driven up. And so I got a rental car, and I drove to the arena. Well, the next morning, we're driving back before the limos and the, and the corporate jets and all this stuff. So the next morning, I see uh, Bruce and Pat over there with Vince, and I come walking down. I see this big smile on their face. Briscoe, you got to rent a car uh, keys? I said, I sure do. Yeah, uh, so I take them out of my pocket. Bruce grabs them out of my pocket. Bruce and Pat take off. And now I'm stuck to make that drive with Vince from, from uh, Albany over to Lowell, about three hour drive. And uh, I get in the car. I've never been in a car with Vince before. And man, I never seen anybody drive so fast in all my life. And you know that that highway there, that's not a straight highway. It's one that goes through the mountains there and you're curving all around. We're taking those curves at 90 mile an hour. And I've got that seatbelt sensed up. Vince looks over, Briscoe, you're not saying much. I said, man, I can't breathe. <laughs> He scared me to death, so I can't even imagine him behind a wheel of a five-ton truck, man. <laughs> we had to drive Vince a couple times, Tony Chillin. And I remember I was driving, and he goes, Mike, can you can you step on the gas a little bit? And I'm like, sure, sir, no problem. And I'm like, look at him, like, I'm doing 65, 70. And he's like, step on the gas. Come on, let's go. And I'm like, I'm up to 85. He still asked me to step on it. I'm going, <laughs> And I'm like, Chimmel's looking at me. I'm looking at Chimmel. I'm like, oh my God, you know. <laughs> but uh, I mean, there was times. I remember Vince had us, they had us parking cars at Christmas, uh, like Christmas Eve one night, parking cars at his house at his, you know, mansion in Connecticut. And um, we, we did ballet, Tony Chimmel and I. Cars, so, <laughs> Pat pulling up, this one pulling up, me and Gina. What was that last Christmas? <laughs> that was about 30 something Christmases ago. Uh, 
But uh, people don't realize how fearless Vince is. We're flying one time into White Plains from like a short flight, like Boston or somewhere, and, and the pilot comes back and he goes, "Sir, I, I'm fearless." Uh, and the guy I think had been in, in Iraq flying by pilot. He was guy wasn't scared, and he goes, "But I I, w- I would not fly into this." He yeah. goes, "There's no there's no visibility. There's no nothing." Vince looks up and he goes, so when you get that uh, uniform, do you lose your balls? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, my God. Brian Gewurz was there going, why is Vince arguing with the pilot? Why is Vince arguing with the pilot? <laughs> Brother, We let, that pilot took off. And we were coming in, no visibility. And, I mean, it was like all of a sudden we see the runway land. It was that quick. And the pilot comes back and he goes, Ooh. Vince goes, I told you it'd be fine. <laughs> it's like no big deal. Like, oh my god. I remember this in Iraq. He couldn't fall asleep on that plane either. You fall asleep in front of Vince, boy, that's a no-no, you know? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And he stayed he up the entire time. Asleep. I remember that. So I'd be like, well, okay, great. I'll just, just keep drinking. We'll hang out. <laughs> I'll drink for the next 15 hours, good. apparently. Yeah. <laughs> yeah well, Mike. Hey, I want to. I can't thank you enough for coming on. Me and Jerry have been looking forward to you coming on. I, look, you're one of the good guys, man. It's it's oh. been so much fun. Always from the first day I met you, you're as big a part of WWE as anybody in its history. But you had so many of my matches. You had so much yeah. of Gerald Briscoe being in your ear from Gorilla. So yes. we three had so much interaction over the years. And it's and you, good to did you did you referee my evening gown match? Was that you? I don't, I don't remember. I don't know. Uh, I, but I remember doing a spot with you in an evening gown that you were laughing at me or something like that. Oh, Might have just back, backstage promo. But I was so mad I'm at Google you. I'm going to Google that one. I'm going to Google that one. I was so mad at you when you were just standing there. And you, you were supposed to be laughing, but you were doing one of those laughs like you're doing now. Like you, you know. <laughs> That's the I ugliest bitch. That's a, a you were thinking, thing. that's the ugliest bitch I ever seen in my life. <laughs> <laughs> But, but things Vince used to make us do, right? That's- yeah, but Mike, like John said, man, we've been looking forward to this. You're, you're a blast. You always were on the road. And oh. man, you know, uh, one thing that we have, you know, through all these years, uh, 36 years for me, uh, 35 for you or whatever. And then John, John pushing 25 or whatever it is. And that's all my fault. But Man, you're one. Of Jerry the hired guys. me, greatest hire he ever made. <laughs> Everybody's entitled to a mistake over here along the road. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, we we had so much fun, and uh, you know we, we had such a stressful job, all three of us, you know. But man, with with company like we were sharing today, and and, and and the stories, I mean, that's what made it all worth it. So thank you so much for your time today, for being on there. You're truly a legend. You belong not in the referees Hall of Fame, you know, that one too, but you belong in the WWE Hall of Fame effort with anybody. Your name, your name is right up there with anybody that goes in that thing. So good luck to you. You'll make it, man. I really appreciate that, Jerry. And thank you guys for having me on the show. And I'd love to come back on the show because there's no way you're gonna cram 35 years of stories in a couple hours. So I'd love to join you guys again. And do the show, show again. maybe maybe we can get your friend Chimel to come on that's with exactly you there. <laughs> that's right that's right <laughs> mike you're yeah. always welcome on here Chimel, we're we're not so sure about i know <laughs> i talked to jerry in private <laughs> that's right i'll make you pay you guys to be on the show that's <laughs> there that's you right. go we'll love you hood thanks up. for coming on yeah thank you very thank much you. Guys. thank you brother god bless all right